Good morning, everyone. My name is Delphi Krishna, and I'm the director of Cell and Gene Therapy Platform at GlaxoSmithKline. I'm absolutely delighted to be here today to talk to you about some of the recent financial modeling uh, that we have done, and we have put together a framework to understand when does investing in cell and gene therapy make uh, good business sense. And just a little bit about this uh, um, uh, session. I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes uh, or so. I have a lot of slides, lots of data. Uh, please feel free to catch me after. I'm just going to go through the headline stuff. Uh, and then I'm going to invite uh, a few panel members, and we'll do a few questions, and we'll leave a lot of time for um, questions from the audience. So uh, just briefly, uh, I'll tell you about where do I sit within GSK, what are we trying to achieve, our approach, and some outcomes. So as I mentioned, I sit in the R&D strategy portfolio and operations team, and I'm accountable for three to five year business strategy development and deployment, uh, annual objectives, operational models, strategic workforce planning, and a little bit of uh, portfolio financial modeling as well. Uh, so what we've done in the past uh, six months or so, um, as you all know, we're all very excited to be here uh, because it's an exciting time, huge flurry of investment in cell and gene therapy assets, exciting clinical data, uh, landmark approvals. But a lot of questions remain about the cost and complexity. Um, are there enough patients? Uh, will they be reimbursed? So what we set about to do was we sort of took a step back and we wanted to define the cost and value drivers for cell and gene therapy assets and enable data-driven decisions in, in a large pharma R&D organization uh, and try to put cell and gene therapy assets in the context of other uh, modalities, small molecules, traditional monoclonals and such. Try to understand what the cost of development of one asset is, what the biggest levers are, what is a competitive asset, what is an efficient portfolio, and what technology, infrastructure, and ways of working do we need to adopt that will deliver the highest value? Uh, so what we tried to do was we looked at uh, across four technology platform, about 100 assets. In the ex vivo space, we looked at um, viral modified ex vivo autologous uh, cell therapy. We looked at uh, gene edited, non-viral approaches, um, um, cell therapy. Uh, we looked at allogeneic assets, and, and in the in vivo space, we looked at uh, all the big AAV assets. And we looked at, uh, in terms of indications, we looked at incidence-based indications, uh, all the solid cancers, the lead assets there. And in prevalence-based indications, we looked at the blood disorders, the, the metabolic disorders, uh, neurological disorders, and such. And using publicly available information, we created a bottoms-up development model for all these assets across several technology platforms. And there's a lot of jargon here, but essentially we laid out the plan all the way from selection of a lead molecule to file and launch. And we built a plan shown here as, a, for instance, an oncology example. And we tried to assign using publicly available information and some of our internal experience uh, the 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 amount of money it takes to execute each of these studies and the number of people in the organization, two separate things. And for each of these, we did that systematically for over um, 100 assets. And we call this the cost of development from lead to launch, uh, which incorporates the clinical cost of goods. And then, so what we did was in the top panel here, that's what we did for all the assets. We built the cost of development, which incorporated um, the clinical cost of goods. And in terms of the value for the assets, again, we looked at uh, the incidence rates um, of uh, incident-based indications and prevalence rates, uh, and using um, available um, market share, class share kind of assumptions for cancers, using information on where the expected line of therapy is, where the cell therapies will enter. We build patient hours, use uh, pricing benchmarks to build revenue curves, and here we use the commercial cost of goods, to sort of build like um, a, a discounted cash flow. And depending on whichever asset we, we used, where it was in its phase of development, uh, we used benchmark data or wherever data was available to assign a probability of success. And we discounted the cost or the value by the probability of success. And we came up with this tool called Risk Adjusted Return on Investment uh, to determine asset health. And so again, lots, lots of data alert and lots of jargon, so let me just take you through it. So depending on how big the clinical program was, uh, the cost of development, this is lead to launch, 
inclusive of clinical cost of goods, we found that it was somewhere from 200 million to 300 million to or all the way to 600 to 700, with the oncology programs being on the higher end because they had uh, larger patient populations, the 300 to 400 uh, um, patient population clinical programs. And um, what we found was that roughly 50% of that was attributed to the people that would deliver these assets in a development organization, and then other 50% was just the cost of executing these studies, whether they're clinical studies or it's process development, tech transfer, uh, et cetera. It was obviously skewed towards, um, towards the later phase of development. And when you look at the CMC component of the non-people costs, and this is an oncology um, uh, ex vivo cell therapy example, uh, autologous, uh, what you see is that the biggest uh, component of that, no surprise here, is the um, patient clinical cost of goods, those big blue things on, on the right um, in the bottom. And uh, what, what we define those as vein to vein cost, that cost of goods that is incurred, and which includes all the way from patient apheresis all the way to shipping. Uh, that was one of the biggest uh, drivers of um, cost, cost of development. And then depending on how big your program was and the number of vector or cell uh, sites which, which, you, which were in your network, uh, it also drove the program costs pretty high. Uh, in terms of clinical, what we found was when we compared the cost of uh, administering these therapies as a sponsor and compared them to monoclonal antibodies or small molecules, the cost per patient was almost double. And it was largely driven by in these cell therapies uh, for screening large number of patients to identify eligible patients, uh, screen rate failures, biomarkers, more complexity essentially. Um, and, and, and when you look at the people cost over the lifetime of a project, especially if you're building an organization, what we found was that a, a, a strong CMC organization was very, very important uh, because of the complexity in, in the CMC. So you can see that the big blue thing in, um, down in the bottom is all CMC people. So those are the big cost drivers. Um, it, when we tried to do the value drivers, what we did was we did sort of a sensitivity analysis and we did, did two bookends. Um, so on the one end, we had a very healthy asset with a risk-adjusted return on investment of seven. On the other hand, we had it close to one. And then we looked at all parameters uh, by keeping like price and market share, those kind of commercial assumptions constant. And what we found was time to market, probability of success, and patient number that you could achieve, your revenue generation, generating patient numbers, absolutely critical. Uh, in terms of uh, extracting the value out of uh, an asset. And if the assets were very healthy, uh, which is um, um, ROI close to seven, um, it, it was a large number of patients, um, about 8,000. But if the assets are close to, especially in ex vivo autologous, 1,500 to 2,000 patients, then almost every parameter in that cost of development was, uh, was making the asset uncompetitive. And so uh, in order to define when does investing make business sense, we looked at all the assets. Um, again, incidence and prevalence, ex vivo and in vivo. And we came up with this metric of uh, risk adjusted return of three to four. We felt that a cell and gene therapy asset could compete with uh, asset from any modality uh, in, in small molecules or uh, traditional monoclonals in, in, that, um, in that range in, in the earlier phase of development. And, um, and with, with the price benchmarks that are shown here, which are publicly available, we sort of build model programs. Um, and with, in the incidence base, close to six to 8,000 patients every year. And in the prevalence base, uh, about total achievable around 8,000 patients with the way we modeled it, roughly 2,000 patients every year. And then uh, the population is pretty much um, uh, accounted for. Um, and so to, uh, to please the portfolio hawks, we put it all on, on, a, um, on a curve, which we call the efficient frontier, uh, where the x-axis is uh, cumulative risk-adjusted development costs, and the y-axis is cumulative um, NPV. And so we took all of the assets, we computed their return on investment, we rank ordered them, and assets which were at the, the slope of the curve, which are healthy assets close to um, four to 5,000 patients a year, not too high de development costs were in the efficient part of the curve, 
and assets where you are not able to make the argument, at least the scientific argument, that we could reach 1,000 to 2,000 patients, whereas you were putting down seven, 800 million were in, in, in the flat part. The important thing here is because we had this framework, we could play around with how you could actually design a program depending on the patient population that you might have available uh, for, for the indication and the platform of choice. And, and so finally, just a few, few takeaways here. Uh, what we found, our modeling suggested, was that early commercial input was absolutely vital to developing a competitive asset profile. And in fact, uh, the size of the commercial opportunity be good to determine how big your supply chain footprint should be, how much time you should take, um, how much cost you should invest. Um, we also found that um, a cycle time from lead to launch of roughly five years is highly beneficial for a competitive asset. And I personally believe that the cell and gene therapies are uh, going to bust the drug development paradigm of eight to 10 years, and the trailblazers in this room will absolutely lead the way four to six years to market. That's the way it's going to be. Um, uh, we also found that clinical development plans, which minimize time to POS, um, uh, the creative designs, very, very important. Couple mentioned there. Uh, platform CMP, CMC processes, which can, which can essentially uh, let you plug and play. Uh, again, very important. Um, in terms of technology, um, for example here for, again, ex vivo um, autologous viral, uh, process intensification of vector, a lot of the approaches that we've tried for traditional monoclonals can be applied to uh, vector process development and manufacture, uh, expected to drastically reduce the cost of goods to make viral vectors essentially as cheap, if not cheaper, than non-viral vectors. Um, shortening cell process time, high throughput analytical methods, all very important to bring those costs of goods down in clinical and commercial. And finally, in, in terms of infrastructure, early investments, especially for prevalence-based diseases, where there is a set patient pool of population, uh, very, very important to be a master of your own destiny. Um, and, and we also found that uh, creating a deep talent pipeline and strong training programs for, for uh, our cell and gene therapy talent was extremely important. Uh, so with that, I will stop. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'd love to invite the panel on the stage. Uh, so Brian Bronk is the head of business development, rare diseases and blood disorders uh, at Sanofi. Bradley Campbell, president and chief operating officer at Amicus. Mitchell Feiner is the chief scientific officer at Elevate Bio. Toby Freeman, senior director, uh, head of rare diseases at Takeda. And Gerald Davis, managing partner at Burson Ventures. Thank you, gentlemen. Welcome. So um, if you could, uh, in, in the first question, introduce a little bit yourself, your organization, but tell us what methods do you use in your organization to assess investment potential of assets? And do you give advice to your organizations uh, on proactive strategies when you find um, a certain commercial window? Great, so um, my name's Mitchell Feiner. Uh, I'm an executive partner at MPM Capital. So on one hand, I have a venture outlook. The other hand, uh, given the complexities of development of products in the cell gene therapy and regenerative medicine, we created an entity called Elevate Bio, which is an accelerator for moving forward companies more rapidly through the cell gene therapy and regenerative medicine development space. Uh, Elevate is essentially uh, a model where we can invest in companies, we can seed companies, or we can act like a traditional venture investor with the same kinds of venture dollars. But we also offer uh, soup to nuts in terms of commercial, clinical, uh, CMC, and, and R&D, so our portfolio companies can access uh, all of those services that exist and we don't have to start from scratch. You know, management doesn't have to spend time raising money and uh, hiring. They have a core scientific nucleus and then all the infrastructure they can tap into, including the pain point of cell gene therapy and regenerative medicine, which is uh, the CMC piece, so process development, analytics, 
manufacturing, QC, all of the things you, you have mentioned. And so when we think about investing, uh, we uh, think about a mix. We have a diversified portfolio. Uh, we have some late stage assets uh, that we believe had a high probability of success. And we're also betting on some very early longer term programs that are based on transformative technologies. So we have a, I would say, a very blended asset portfolio. Some of it, some of them look like traditional venture investments, uh, like what I've done at MPM Capital, where we invest in uh, early stage transformative technologies like we did with Semitherapeutics, which was our regenerative medicine platform. Uh, high risk, but uh, high reward. Uh, that uh, uh, Semo was recently uh, sold to Vertex, but that was a tremendous regenerative medicine platform we built. So we look at, we also look at single asset companies. Again, if we see that we can accelerate these companies uh, to the next stage and monetize the asset. So it's, um, there's no grand scheme. It's uh, on an asset by asset. Uh, and we tend to do both technology platforms uh, or single assets that we think we can uh, increase value in the very near term. Great. Uh, I'm Bradley Campbell. I'm the President Chief Operating Officer of Amicus Therapeutics. Um, we are a company focused on developing next generation therapeutics for patients living with rare and orphan diseases. We have a rich history in the space. Um, we've been around for more than 15 years. We have a commercial product uh, that's a small molecule. I'm giving my company presentation later, so I'll, I'll save most of that for the, for the talk later. Uh, we also have a, a biologic and enzyme replacement therapy in, in phase three development for Pompe disease. Uh, but last year, we decided to invest deeply into uh, the gene therapy space. We started from a very different place, I think, because we our traditional uh, drug development had been initially small molecules, but then uh, protein therapeutics. And so we really didn't have a, a platform that we were tied to, and that gave us a lot of flexibility. We really started instead from looking at the landscape that we knew well, lysosomal storage disorders primarily, but, but orphan diseases broadly, and thought about where was the unmet need? And, um, and where could we find technologies that could then meet that unmet need? And we ended up settling on really two distinct platforms. One is AV delivered intrathecal uh, gene therapies for CNS disorders. And that was through an acquisition of a company called Salinex. And then the second was a broad uh, partnership, which we've since actually expanded with Jim Wilson at UPenn. Uh, looking at next generation, both vectors, but also next generation uh, gene transfers uh, with protein engineering to improve targeting uptake, et cetera. So we, we I think, in some ways were advantaged because we didn't have uh, a legacy of, of a technology that we had to support or continue to invest in. On the other hand, uh, you have to make sure that, that you're uh, investing in technologies that you think will, will provide value for your shareholders and provide value for patients. And so we do use some of the, I think, financial tools that, that you shared, although I don't know if they're quite as, um, as sophisticated as GSK could bring to bear, but, but certainly it's kind of the standard elements of, of probability of success and, and net present value, et cetera. But, but I think also we thought a lot about the systemic elements that go into some of the, the uh, factors that you talked about, size of population, whether the products would be systemically delivered or, or delivered intrathecally, that has knock-on effects in terms of capacity what you need to build from a manufacturing perspective, whether the technologies existed or not around manufacturing. So I think there are some, some both systemic and structural elements that, that we took a hard look at, but also um, some different thresholds uh, in terms of what we really expected to get from those, from those investments. And um, you know, we don't have a top line that we need to get to a certain level around. It was really more around making sure that we could develop a quality medicine that made a difference for patients, and, and we were confident if we could do that, we could find a way to make it work. So I'm Gerald Davis. We're an early stage investor at Versant Ventures, uh, doing seed and Series A investments for almost 90 plus percent of our companies. Um, you know, I'd say in the cell and gene therapy field, we've done now eight uh, deals. I may, may have missed one, so I won't name them. Um, and, and about half those companies are companies that we built together with an academic or an entrepreneur internally at Versant, and half are companies where we've syndicated with a larger inv investment group. Uh, you know, as we think about uh, investment decisions, which I, I think is really the question, um, we aren't burdened by a big portfolio. We, we don't have portfolio hawks. Um, you know, what we're really trying to decide is do we want to back an enterprise, uh, a new company in a given field? 
you know, I, I think it's a little dangerous, especially at the early stages we're looking at these opportunities to try to assess and judge a lot of variables at once. And so we try to keep it really simple. Um, we try to make sure we're not making an irrational commercial decision. You can't have a product where the COGS is greater than the potential price point. You can't have a patient population for which there's no opportunity. Um, but beyond that, we focus on that one toggle, which is, is it gonna work? Um, and so that's the one where we spend all of our time passing judgment. Do we think this is gonna work to have you know, potentially disruptive uh, clinical impact for patients? Uh, and so that's where we spend almost all of our time, and, and our belief is if, we, if that is the case, and the enterprise, the company we back, can generate that data, um, then the rest of it will work itself out. Um, we can talk more about CMC, and we also have strong opinions about how you have to assemble a team to back some of these companies, but I'll stop there. Hello, everyone. Uh, Brian Bronk, I lead business development at Santa Fe for Rare Diseases and, and Rare Blood Disorders, and so clearly that touches on the, uh, the, the topic here for uh, at gene and cell therapy. Uh, when we think about investments, and this is internal and, and external, all of the components that, uh, that we think about have already been mentioned. There's no single rubric that we turn to to decide whether an investment is, is sensible or not. Uh, with the history and the legacy of, uh, of Genzyme, the patient is the focus, the unmet medical need is where we start. We think about the disease severity and, and what needs to be treated. We think about our ability to interrupt the disease, and so the, the, the science, will it actually work, becomes an important driver. We certainly think about the overall costs and the challenges that the development uh, will, will uh, face us with. Um, that, is, that is an important aspect of what we think about. And we also spend time thinking about how quickly can we get to a next decision point. So we, we, we want to be thoughtful about uh, you know, reaching decisions that are, that are based on, on data, based on science, while also keeping in mind we don't want to start something that we're not prepared to finish. And some of these modalities are very new, unproven, and uh, we, we do spend some time thinking about for our overall organization what the, what the burden, what the cost will be. Is it an N of one or is it an N of 10 that we'll be able to use in, in that platform? Um, yeah, so let me stop there and uh, let's turn it over to Toby. Great. Okay, thanks, Brian. So Toby Fryman from Takeda Pharmaceuticals. Uh, I sit in our Center for External Innovation and I head rare disease business development. Um, also within the Center for External Innovation in Takeda, we have Takeda Venture Arm. We also have a strategic ac academic alliance arm. So we have a variety of different ways that we look to partner with um, outside parties. Um, I think as we're looking at where we want to make investments, um, first and foremost for Takeda's transformative potential and potential innovation that's bringing to patients. I think that's particularly true we're investing in early stage assets um, where we're not building financial models to look at the potential uh, revenues or NPVs. We're looking at the potential for this product to really bring differentiation and, and change for patients. Um, I think obviously when we're looking to partner versus build it internally, we're thinking when do we bring uh, value to the table. We have a, a strong capability in AAV, AAV manufacturing. We've from the Legacy Shire organization. Um, we also have some cell therapy capabilities from the Takeda organization. Um, as we get to later and later stage assets, of course, we're building financial models to, to help us look at um, key inflection points for those, for those technologies. And it's, it's a challenge with cell and gene therapy to project all of the different variables we're looking at in terms of long-term COGS and, and how, what we could expect in terms of improvements as we get to different scale, but having some of these capabilities internally does give us a, a good opportunity to, to project some of those things. And, and um, you know, I think that we are taking a, a portfolio type approach across both early and later stage investments in both cell and gene therapy. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. So there's so many technology platforms, ex vivo, in vivo, viral, non-viral, autologous, allogeneic, um, in building winning portfolios, I'm going to try to be a little cheeky here. Um, do, you, do, you, do you look at companies or within the organization at one technology pr platform, let's focus on it, or do you spread the risk, Pay, place a lot of bets? Why don't we start with the investors on the panel? 
Yeah, no, I, I think for our, for the eight companies that um, we've done in the field, I think all of those companies actually have a platform technology and they have a very clear product out of the gate. You know, we're not going to back a platform company that doesn't have a very clear uh, first one or two products. Um, but we also believe this field is very, very young. And so the technologies are not commoditized like antibody or small molecule technologies. We have to assemble a team, which requires a lot of resources, the blue slice of that pie chart around CMC in particular, um, that actually is going to be the platform. So whether it's going to be a team that can master the manufacturing aspects, or whether it's a technology like a CRISPR or Blue Rock that are you know, new technologies, we always have had those platform aspects in the companies that we've uh, done thus far in the space. Yeah, so at, at Elevate, because we built the company around the CMC space and the cell gene therapy and regenerative medicine, and we have a team who's manufactured these products over many years, uh, we, we see a reasonable amount of interchangeability of unit operations. And so we're very comfortable with uh, making AAV, making Lenti, uh, engineering uh, T cells with TCRs or CARs, uh, generating virus specific T cells. And so we're, we're, we're very comfortable with manufacturing and developing all those products. And so into our portfolio, we've incorporated those products. And as I said, our goal was to achieve, you know, as we're starting launching this company Elevate, we wanted to achieve a balanced portfolio. So we have a uh, very late stage asset, uh, Alivir, which is our first portfolio company we announced. Uh, we'll be entering pivotal studies early next year. Uh, we have companies, uh, one, a second company that we announced uh, yesterday, High Pass, in phase one, two. You know, Alivir is a virus specific T cell, so that's non engineered, uh, and High Pass, which is targeting uh, advanced leukemia relapses, uh, that's an engineered TCR. So there's enough fluency to move back and forth within these uh, core technologies that can also uh, encompass, for instance, AAV. So with the uh, flexibility to be able to uh, do the development uh, and also manufacture and release quality products, um, we've looked at a variety of different asset classes and we've been successful at moving those forward. Others on the panel like to chime in? So I'll, I, um, when we think about it, so the, the way I, I like to, to describe it is are we exclusive, equal, or equitable in our, our, our thinking on the platforms? And we definitely congregate on, on certain areas where we, we feel we have expertise and we can build the capacity and deliver multiple therapeutics. And the AAV gene therapies is, is the place where I think everyone in the industry is, is most comfortable. But we're not shy about the other, uh, the other modalities, the other approaches. Again, it's what's going to serve the, the patient the best that, that does drive us. In those instances, though, where, where we're, we're looking at a different modality, we will rely on partners a lot more. So there's a difference between uh, staying away from a, uh, a, uh, an approach versus relying on a partner to, to help, uh, help deliver that therapy to the patients. And we've, we've got some uh, very public examples where we're doing exactly that. Um, but we, within the organization, we'll definitely find a, one or two sweet spots where we think we can really uh, take it and, and make sure that we have the portfolio delivering. You, as you said before, um, you know, controlling your own uh, destiny is an important aspect. Any words from Toby? Yeah, I think when we, we spread, we have multiple bets, but I think in any one platform, once it's, once it's hit a certain bar, as Brian was describing, we obviously want to go after it with multiple targets. So we're not jeopardizing the platform investment with something that may be unique to a specific indication. So we do that, but then also as we think about um, making uh, broader investments across platforms, if it's an earlier platform, there's still some major questions that we want answered. Um, Likely, we don't have the tools ourselves, so we'll, we'll look to partner with a company and, and try to answer those questions through some sort of a collaboration that, that gets answers to the questions that we're looking for, and then we might be in a position to make a broader investment in that specific platform. Yeah, the only thing I would add there is, you know, for us, so we, all of our pr uh, products are AV delivered, although we're looking at some novel vectors, so some of it's AV9 for the Selenex portfolio, and some of it will be next generation vectors. 
but even there, so you could you could argue that's kind of a platform play. Certainly, the the Selenex assets, which are are um, part, they came out of Nationwide Children, so it's Brian Kaspar is the the inventor of that technology. You could argue that's that is kind of a platform approach because they're delivered so similarly, and it's all within a, a couple of disease families. But even within that, you know, we will be manufacturing on on Hyperstacks, on Icellus. We have to solve how we're going to manufacture for our uh, our uh, systemically delivered programs for Pompeii, Fabre, et cetera. So even within AV, I think there's you know there's some platform approach, but but we have a lot of problems to solve, and I think we would have to be careful to to really sort of you know say we have a reproducible uh, kind of platform in, in any of those technologies. Okay, thank you. So instead of waiting till then, why don't we see if uh, the audience has any questions? Any questions from the audience? Right here. Hi there. Um, uh, because so many of you on the panel are uh, focused in the rare disease world, um, I have a question or a comment about the value of patient relationships and, and advocacy um, when you're looking at investments in rare diseases. Um, do you look at, at companies who have already built relationships with their patient communities? Um, and how do you assign value long term to the success of the company um, from that perspective? So I'll start representing the legacy of Genzyme. Yes, we think very closely about developing those relationships with the patient communities. And not from a financial modeling perspective, but just the ability to find the patients, to organize the groups, to get the clinical trials run, to get those therapies to the patients as fast as possible. It's, it's something that we feel very strongly about and we continue to build, uh, to build on that. Um, that it's, a, it's a back and forth. It is a dialogue that we, uh, we continue to rely on with the, the patient advocacy groups to make sure that we understand the disease, we understand how quickly, what's their patient journey? That's one of the top questions we ask ourselves. How quickly in the disease process are they finally diagnosed, and what's the probability of us being able to deliver a therapy at that time, and do we have to move it earlier? Do we have to get that diagnosis earlier? We're, we can think about those things. Talking to the, to the patients and the patient advocacy groups actually gives us the true answer. Yeah, I, from an amicus perspective, Similar, our you know deep roots in patient advocacy. We have a chief patient advocate, and and many of the diseases that we're focused on, we already had relationships in the community, um, which is really important. And I don't think you can put a value on that, although I know that's not exactly what you what you were implying. Uh, but it is critically important to the drug development process to have those links. I will say there, what is I think increasingly sophisticated is the work that those groups are doing ahead of time. And so, for example, and I think Dr. Marks mentioned in his talk around. Um, uh, registries or databases, uh, natural history cohorts within the patient advocacy community. And that's something that, that is real and it does have real value. It saves a lot of time, especially if it's sophisticated enough. And, and what we're finding is in many of these disease areas now, there really is a level of sophistication that's useful even from a regulatory perspective. So I think that actually has tangible value, but th those relationships are, are immensely valuable, but you know, challenging to measure. I would just add, as making investments in early stage companies that may have a very specific disease they're, they're going to pursue, I'd say the patient advocacy group is one of the first five calls that we make. And we fundamentally want to understand two things. One, one is what is the patient experience and what does that mean for how disruptive a new treatment could, could be? And then number two is enrollability. So fundamentally, we have to pass a very quick judgment on can you enroll a trial? Can you find the patients to, in a finite period of time, um, get to value inflection. And so patient advocacy groups have gone up in importance even in our early stage decision making. I think we have another, yeah. Uh, we saw a financial model there with 8,500 patients for AAV. That's obviously not the reality of rare or ultra rare disease. Uh, Dr. Marx showed a cutoff of maybe 100 or less. What is the minimum threshold number that is financially viable for AAV in vivo? <laughs> Somewhere in there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think, we, we talked about this leading into the panel, I, I do think that there's like a thousand number which I think floats around quite a bit. Um, but, but if you think about all the inputs around that, which is, you know, in our case, some of our Batten diseases are, are around that number, 1,000 patients. 
But the reality is, you know, it's intrathecally delivered. The amount of material we need is next to nothing. There's some precedent, although we need to have conversations with regulators um, around this, but our strategy would be to, to do an adaptive phase one, two study with natural history, which Brenuria, which is a, 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 a product that was approved for CLN2. Uh, it's a protein replacement, but you know, so there is some precedent for that. So I think, I think there are ways to change the variables and the structure, structural elements to make that number more or less achievable. I, I do think, and, and Dr. Marks alluded to it, the future has to be some faster way through the system for those smaller diseases. And if we can get there, I think you can get further and further down the chain. Um, but, but I'm sure there is some number that at, you know, at some point becomes unattainable for now uh, for, for at least companies of our size. I think for us, given uh, we're primarily in the oncology area, but we have looked in the orphan disease space. And uh, our CEO, David Halal, uh, the former CEO of Alexion, you know, they covered diseases of, uh, you know, vastly different numbers of patient populations. And, you know, we apply that algorithm in our commercial analysis. So I think that um, we could see striking a balance of, you know, going down to, we've considered going down to the ultra rare, uh, providing, you know, innovative transformative therapies. I think it's been covered. I mean, we don't, there's no magic number. Yeah. Um, I think, and, and my, my encouragement is that we all continue to push hard here because the faster we can get through the process, the, the less expensive the, the manufacturing becomes, the more patients we're gonna be able to serve. So where we are today versus where we'll be in a decade, as we were talking about in the previous discussion, um, it, it, it's going to change. We need to continue to push that evolution. Yeah, I mean, our mo modeling indicates uh, something like 500 to 1,000, as was, as was mentioned. But then the onus is on the sponsor to have a small clinical program not, uh, with, with a small defined patient population. And perhaps for the, for the diseases with numbers less than that, as Dr. Marks mentioned, a public-private partnership is a better model um, as opposed to just, you know, just purely commercial. I guess the one thing I'd add to that is, I, I'm not, I don't know a specific number, but I will say that investments in uh, patient databases that give us a better way to stratify patients and be more efficient at running clinical trials and be more efficient at identifying the patients who will most benefit from the therapy, uh, that's gonna change the math, um, but that's still an evolving piece of this field as well. Other questions? So on other hand. Yeah, please, go ahead. have a big mouth, they can probably hear me. Um, I just wonder how early you start thinking about reimbursement challenges and the issues with reimbursement, because you can have the most effective drug in the world, but if we can't pay for it and get it to the patients, uh, certainly, as Dr. Mark said, maybe this, this combination, public and, and, uh, and, and private, um, may help. But when you're making that evaluation, how early do you start thinking about reimbursement, the pricing, and uh, the barriers of getting this to the market as, far, as part of your decision process? I mean, maybe I can start because we're probably the earliest here. Um, I'd say we do first pass assessment of that you know, immediately. So we have to make sure that the, the cogs of whatever approach we're gonna take at scale is l significantly lower than, um, than a price you can command depending on what that disease is. And you know, there, are, there are a number of investment opportunities for which we think the efficacy could actually be quite profound, but we're just nowhere in the zone to have a viable um, product from a, a cost point of view. So I think that puts you know, pressure on the system to evolve our process development, our cell sources to um, do better there. Um, I think the other thing you know, we look at pretty hard is, and there's a number of companies presenting here that are ha having products that are mo gonna move into a capitated environment. And so that's another, first pass question we have to figure out, you know, if you're gonna go into the transplant setting or a certain other setting or the, or the dialysis setting, you know, how, how is that gonna play? And you know, I think the diagnostics uh, experience in the investment community over the last 20 years has shown that you hope these market failures will work themselves out prior to launching a product, but they actually don't always do so. So we do some pretty early first pass analyses. It's usually along the lines of those things rather than a more sophisticated 
uh, modeling? It's a very important question. And, and we, we aspire to bring our therapies, as everyone does here, but across the globe. And, and so there are certain areas of the world where we, we think we've got a good understanding of what those, those sensitivities for reimbursement will be. And there are lots of areas of the world where it's still an unknown. Um, so we, we take that quite seriously on the, on the chart that uh, we saw before. I felt that that was a missing row at the bottom, is probability of reimbursement. Uh, and we have to take that um, into account it would be a tragedy to have a, a medically meaningful therapy available other than cost, and we need to avoid that because we, you know, we're making decisions on where we put our resources, where we put our efforts, and that would have been a bad choice if we do that. So we have to work proactively to make sure that those barriers are coming down and also be you know, pragmatic about what the system is, is able to, to manage as we understand it today. I mean, I would just build on that and basically say that um, the earliest decisions we're making are based on the transformative potential of the technology. Is there data that's demonstrating that it's hitting the, the biological target? Um, is there an unmet need that this is going to address? And if those pieces are falling into place, um, some of these therapies are so different and so new, and especially in the US, the reimbursement and market access landscape is so complex, it may not even be tractable to think beyond just initial thoughts, but I would say that we are engaging with our reimbursement and market access colleagues earlier in the process, and I, I think it's important to, to, to help, not just as a company, but as a, as a community, educate the payers more and sooner and engage in that dialogue sooner, because it's complicated. Right, well, um, in terms of technology investments for your chosen platforms, um, which one or two things come to your mind would drastically bring down the cost of goods? Um, yesterday we heard uh, from um, the president and founder of AskBio that we should just not be thinking about um, the Americas and the Europe, Europe or European countries. Where do you think the biggest potential is in terms of technology? For, for your platforms that you're looking at? I can start, I, you know, Elevate, where our, again, we come back to this, the core is the CMC, and for the cell therapies, really the, the product is the process, and I think that we're making a significant investment in process automation, right? Because what drives your cost up, I mean, raw materials are raw materials, uh, your uh, sweet time and your people time and so to compress the footprint, right? And you know, the second part relates to the biology. You know, we have these long expansion times for many of these T cell products. Uh, we, lose, we lose potency during these long expansion times. So for instance, in aloe vera, we developed, uh, compared to some of the other virus-specific T cell processes that run on the order of three to four weeks, you know, we're down to 10 to four days, right? So, Again, really push down the cost, really focus on the CMC, understand the uh, critical quality attributes that need to be maintained in the product, and then really push you know, from a, both science and a basic science and a process standpoint to collapse the time to get as potent as a product uh, or maintain the potency with either fewer cell numbers, shorter expansion times. But really, you know, we have, you know, there's this dream of uh, allogeneic uh, T cell products, and in some cases, like we're using a uh, our third party off the shelf T cell product is an allogeneic, but that fits into a special category of bone marrow transplant recipients, solid organ transplants, where you have a window of immune suppression that gives you a little bit more flexibility. But in terms of autologous engineered T cells versus allogeneic, right, the scientific complexity to get the ideal allogeneic off-the-shelf T cell versus what we can do with you know, traditional engineering to bring down uh, the cost and the time and compress the footprint. You know, I, I, I think you know, th that's a race that is more than likely winnable in a reasonable period of time without the unknowns of new science and clinical evaluation. Others on the panel? Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of new technologies, you know, the two things we think a lot about are fundamental changes in cost 
and functionality. So a new technology that can drive down the cost, and for us it's either the more um, incremental process development, but very, very important things that could change how cost-effective uh, production of a certain cell type or uh, vector would be, um, but also cell source. So one of our companies, Blue Rock, made a bet, I think a little ahead of the curve, on iPSC-based technologies with the belief that you could actually make larger cell doses uh, if you're starting with iPSC and more off-the-shelf approaches rather than, uh, than autologous. You know, Century Therapeutics, another one of our uh, companies, is making a bet on cell source as a way to drive down cost in the CAR-T uh, or NK field. So, um, you know, Fate Therapeutics, I see Dan sitting here, is also making a uh, bet in that space. So, you know, I, I think cost is one area we see technologies and then functionality. And at Versant, we put deals maybe cheesily into two buckets. One is a, what we call bend the curve. So something that can do a lot better job of you know, tropism to a certain tissue type for AAV. Um, but take, take a technology to the next level and address indications, diseases that weren't, weren't otherwise be addressable. That's kind of a bend the, bend the curve uh, deal or investment for us. And then we have create the curve deals. And so when we were working on, on, on CRISPR before it was really a thing, you know, that was create the curve. We knew we were out there over our skis and we hoped that could become a new category. I think some of the IPSC uh, technologies we put in the same uh, category. So we, we think about cost, we think about functionality, and we try to figure out are we really bending the curve um, or, or are we trying to create a curve? And the create the curve opportunities are very few uh, and far between. We probably see one of those every, every two or three years at best. Yeah, I think it's a great point. If you can, and that's one of the things we're focused on with Dr. Wilson at UPenn is if we can create a gene therapy that is more effective because it has a better a protein that is expressed and is targeted better to the key tissues so you can deliver a lower dose, you know, that can solve a whole host of your issues around the manufacturing side. And so, you know, we very much are thinking about it the same way, which is, yes, we can focus on manufacturing technologies, but frankly, we're not the experts. We've got a long way to come up the curve there, but we can focus on making a product that has more efficacy, more potency, gets to the right tissues, and therefore, you don't need to deliver the high doses that require so much product to be made. Anything to add, Jim? Maybe just one outside the box thing I'll add is, um, I think investment in biomarkers and other tools that could help us be more efficient at moving into the clinic, selecting the right dose, and progressing through to properly powered pivotal trials faster, helps manage a portfolio. I mean, I think it's, useful if you're bringing multiple products to, to market on that, or if you're looking at a specific tissue system like CNS and you can develop biomarkers that will help you evaluate the efficacy um, earlier in the clinic, and help you evaluate either multiple uh, candidates or the dose, as I said before. Um, I think that could be, uh, go a long way to reducing the cost of uh, getting some of these products to market. Okay. Um, Final question, I'd love everybody's opinion on this one. So according to ARM, there have been billions of dollars that have been invested in cell and gene therapies in the past few years. And as we all know, there are significant challenges, probably a long ramp to return. Is this a bubble and will it burst? Who would like to start? <laughs> we wouldn't be sitting here if we thought the bubble was gonna burst. <laughs> uh, so we have an incredible evolution ahead of us, right? But the 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 responsibility we have to help that evolution, to, to catalyze it, the, the investment's been made, the, the medical benefit that we can bring is profound. The system is stressed. We are pushing it even harder. It's, there is going to be ebbs and flows. Some of us are gonna fail, but across the, across the group, we're not all gonna fail. And we just have to be perseverant and, and carry forward with it and be ready to help. I mean, there's, I don't see, I don't have the answer. If any of us had the answer, we, we wouldn't be sitting here but we just need to continue to push forward knowing that there are patients waiting for us that are going to benefit significantly from what we're doing. And uh, we'll just have to keep pushing the system and, and stressing it. I was gonna say, I think the question up to a few years ago was, can an engineered cell or a non-engineered cell or an engineered virus actually be developed as a pharmaceutical product? And you know, now, now the answer is resoundingly yes. And, and so with that, I think it's, it's going to actually flip because there are so many degenerative disorders, right, that are not addressable by tra uh, traditional uh, approaches to medicine. And I think, you know, this is also the question of, you know, gene therapy in the orphan disease space. Are there cells to actually 
put a gene back in and actually gain some function. So I, I think we've seen a, a, a great growth and great success in the viral mediated gene therapy, but I think we'll see even more regenerative medicine therapies enter the clinic, you know, as we can generate cells for which those cells are no longer there. So I think it's, uh, you know, being, you know, toiling away at this for 33 years uh, and finally seeing it mature, it's great. And I think it's going to continue to grow exponentially because of the possibilities of, you know, we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, I mean, I think there's obviously great potential and there's been a, a lot of amazing advances over just the last five years. Um, I, I guess the way I see things perhaps evolving is a resetting of expectations over the next five to 10 years as these products come to market, as we try to get reimbursement for these products. The word cure has been thrown around a lot. Um, we have data out to several years and you're looking to get reimbursement for products in the face of accelerated uh, clinical development plans and again, you're looking for products that are supposed to have long-term benefit. There's, there's a couple of things there that just aren't lining up quite right. Um, hopefully it all plays out and, and the expectations are met. Um, but I think realistically, there's gonna be some reset of expectations over the near term. But the, the clear reality is there's such a foundation now of advances in technology that we can build from there and keep setting new high expectations and, and reaching those in the future. I think the fact that five or 10 years ago for many diseases we're talking about at this conference, the word cure would be laughed at, and today it's a reality, just speaks volumes. I mean, the efficacy is there for patients, the potential is huge, and yes, there are a number of companies that are small and mid-cap that are overvalued that hedge funds are gonna short in 2020 and <laughs> we're gonna have retrenchment. Um, but long-term macro um, level, I think we've seen the potential this week with the company presentations for patients. Yeah, I, I think we're making a profound change to the way we treat uh, human genetic disease in particular, but really all human diseases. And, you know, we, we really are at the tip of the iceberg. You know, of course, the, the markets will react as they will to a whole host of factors. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we're really fundamentally changing the outcomes for patients and that, and whether it's either truly curative or, or something along the spectrum is, is to be determined. But um, there's so much potential here. It, it will be amazing to think about where we are even in, in five years, even where we are today with some of the therapies that have already been approved. So we're, we're very optimistic and, and thrilled to see all the innovation and what we can do for patients. Any final questions from the audience? All right, well, thank you very much and thanks everyone for your attention.